Hello, hello, and uh, welcome to Her Standards with me, Queen Tambori. Karibu sana. Thank you for keeping it. Her Standards every Saturday from whichever part of the country. Karibu sana, and thank you for joining the show where we connect you to women you need to know, where we set very high standards. But apart from that, we also talk through issues objectively we bring real women real issues real faces some of these topics are very difficult to discuss but we do not shy away from them now today we want to address what happens after being widowed and i'm very excited to be joined by beautiful beautiful uh, uh rahab gatsura rahab is a librarian she's a motivational speaker but other than that she has been living as a widow for many 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 years and I'm sure at the end of the show, you'll be able to get to know her story and also get inspired by that. You'll be able to, she'll be able to introduce herself in briefly. And then, of course, I am joined by Pastor Mweni Wambua, Karibu Sana Mami. She is, uh, she calls herself an authenticity coach. I'm so curious because I want to know what an authenticity coach does. And of course, she's also a trauma and grief therapist. We just want to bounce off ideas of each other understand some of the complexities surrounding this difficult topic on being widowed. Um, in case uh, you are sitting at home and you are a young widow, please sit back because this show will also speak through some of the issues that you have been facing. And who knows, you might just be able to get the energy and the strength to move on despite what happens. So without much ado, let me invite these beautiful ladies or, uh, to her standards, Karibu Sana. Thank you for, you know, giving us your time. You know what I mean. <laughs> we appreciate it so much. So, for the benefit of uh, the, the viewers who are probably meeting you for the very first time, I always like to allow my guests to briefly describe themselves, what they do in this beautiful Nairobi city of ours. Let me start with you, Pastor Mweni. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I do three things. I'm an authenticity coach, I'm a grief therapist, and I'm a pastor. What does that all mean? Mm -hmm. It means that I help people navigate the changes and challenges of life in a manner that one is true to their reality because we all have different realities. Yeah, In a manner that protects their dignity because sometimes we go through um, changes and challenges of life and transitions that leave us feeling very stripped of our dignities. And number three, because I am a pastor and I am a believer that ultimately God has a plan for our lives. But when we go through some of these challenges, we feel like the plan has been thwarted. Mm -hmm. The plan has been thrown off. But I believe that there's a way in that, in, in that way, there's always a way in which that plan still reconnects to what God has in store for you. So some, of, some of your clients are, are women who have been widowed? Yes. Um, Many times when people hear I'm a grief therapist, they only think of grief in terms of loss of a loved yes. one. But there are up to 42, at least 42 things that can happen to a human being that will cause them grief. So there's a whole range from, from divorce and separation, loss of a loved one, loss of a job, transferring your children from one school to another, loss of a pet, mm -hmm. uh, Starting a new job, quitting an old an, an, a, a job, relocation, all those things cause us grief. Because essentially grief is defined as the end of life as you have known it. And grief is also defined as the normal and natural reaction to loss. Think about it, Quinta. If you lost your phone, your heart has palpitations. <laughs> it's a loss. And sometimes when we lose our phone, the, the, the loss is not just the value, the cost of the phone, but it's the data inside. If the phone was a gift to you, it's the emotional attachment to it. This was a gift that was given to me by my mother, and then they passed on. So that phone is not just an, a gadget for communication. There's a lot of emotions invested around it. So losing it feels big, can, can have many dimensions of loss. A lot from you today. We will milk you dry. <laughs> I can assure you. And also, uh, we have here the beautiful uh, Rehab Gatura. Rehab is not just a motivational speaker, she's actually a, an author, and we'll be able to 
uh, try and uh, dissect this book that she has written called Overcoming Life's Challenges. Interesting. Rehab, karibu sana. Thank you very much. Uh, you are a retired librarian. Yes, I am a retired librarian. My name is Raha Pugatora, and I'm happy to be in this show. And I'm a grandmother. I'm a mother of three, but I, the grandmother part is what I like most. I'm a librarian <laughs> by profession, but now retired. So most of the time now I'm a motivational speaker and an author. And my main focus, I like encouraging, especially single moms and widows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many that grand, is, grandchildren? I have three grandchildren. Are they watching? They're, <laughs> they're in school. Okay. Yeah. All yeah. Right. Mm. Karibu sana. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, remember, we are available across all social media platforms at KTN Home. You can also hit me up at Quintum Bori, and uh, that is on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on TikTok. If you are seated at home or if you're watching us from whichever part of this country and you have a pressing question regarding grief, regarding being widowed, regarding loss, then do not hesitate. Hit us up. Go to the comment section and type those questions quick because we have the experts in the house. If you're wondering where this beautiful location is, we are at the James Suits Riverside in Westlands. All I can say is you need to dash to their social media pages, find out the kind of services that they offer but also if you can walk in there's no harm come in for a meal you can have your conferences you can have a meeting you can have your staycation there is so much that gym suits riverside are offering now we're just gonna go right into it i'm going to read what raha wrote, has written at the back of her book she, she says that none of us is immune from the storms of life the difference is how we handle them but I'm just going to focus on that first part of uh, the preview. None of us is immune from the storms. You know, they say life starts at 40, yeah. but mine started falling when I was going to turn 40. That is 1997 in February. 1997 in February. I was going to turn 40 in July, but start, things started falling when my husband suddenly died instantly. He had actually, he took his children to school because those are the times when the people used, tuition was there. So in private school, they would ask the students, the children to be taken to school so that they can perform better. So he took them, it was a Saturday, he took them to school in the morning and then he said he had a, a toothache. I challenged him, why are you keeping on saying, holding your cheek, why don't you go and get checked? So after dropping the school, children in school, he went to see his dentist and came back, picked the children and came, brought them home. We had lunch actually of Gideri. And around five, he started saying he wants to go and rest because he had a headache. My husband was a veterinary doctor, so he said, prescribe, wrote a prescription and send me to the chemist. We are living in Langata. Mm -hmm. And I said, fine, I obeyed as a wife and went and got medication. As I came back, because his brother was visiting, I heard people speaking in my son's bedroom. And I got surprised because normally we would not have guests going upstairs. Mm -hmm. So I went upstairs and found he was not feeling well. Then I said, what's happening? He said, just bring that. He shouted and said, just bring the painkiller, I'll be okay. And as he took it, I saw the condition was not improving. I insisted, let's go to the hospital. And of course, we went downstairs and we got into the car and the children were a bit shocked to see the father is the, who had taken them to school and picked them. He looks a bit weak. So I sat on the driver's seat and I told him to sit at the back with, his, with, with the brother. And we are living in Langata. So as we drove down Uhuru Gardens, uh, my husband says, I can't, we are going to Aga Khan because that's where he had a family doctor. Around Uhuru Gardens, my husband shouted and said, please, I can't make it, take it to Mata. You know, and I looked back and I said, how dare you curse yourself? He said, no, you're going to make it. He said, no, I take me to Mata. And of course, as a wife, I... I remembered that I need to be submitted. <laughs> so I said, let me drive to Mata after all that. Was, so we drove to Mata, and I was not very familiar with that hospital. So as we tried to navigate where to park, a security guard came around and said, you know, I was trying to park next to the door so that we can go in. He said, no, don't park here. Go to the emergency. So as we walked to the emergency room, he showed us the direction. That is Mata. Uh, there was a nation man who was getting into his car and as my husband was coming out he commented be very careful that gentleman is in a lot of danger and i said my god may i cancel that in jesus name how can he say that 
he had a white coat, not knowing, of course, he was a doctor he could see. So we got into the casualty. They took care of my husband, and you know, I was told to go and pay that. We are going to admit him. I said, can't you treat him? We go home. Because for me, I'm not seeing the seriousness. He said, and the nurse told me, Mama, watch a man in mwingi, lipa, ukuje. So from that, he, he told us, we go quickly upstairs. You know, they had already connected an oxygen syringe. And I thought maybe it's not enough, because she's telling us we go up, not knowing it is a seriousness. So we went upstairs to Mata Hospital. I was not familiar. There's not, they, was doing, they were doing renovation, so there was no sign of HDU, ICU. So they connected him to one machine, one bed, and immediately they changed. So I thought maybe the machine there is not, not knowing that was HDU, now this is ICU. In this process of admission, I had, they asked me who is our family doctor, and I had told them. And within no time, I saw my, our family doctor coming in, and I said, Kenya is so advanced. They really have to call the family doctor, not, not knowing they had called my, him because my husband was in Syria. So as they were treating him, I was walking around, and I had my brother and his brother who had come to visit. So I was walking, walking about, and you know, at one time they closed the curtains, and I thought because I was praying and you know, singing a bit quietly. And they closed the curtain and I saw, his, you know, the brother said, no, this, the way these people are running, my brother is in a lot of trouble. Let me go and call our elder brother. So he went, unfortunately they had gone out for dinner, so he, but he left a message. And around nine o'clock, the doctor who was treating at Kashati came outside and his eyes were red and he was a young man. He was, he didn't, he looked okay. Then he asked, are you the spouse? I said, what is it? What is, is there anything wrong? Because now he has, called, are you the doctor? He said, why the doctor is calling you, your family doctor? I said, why are your eyes red? Why are you looking so different? He said, he just held my hand and took me inside where our family doctor was. And then the doctor held my hands and the, he told me we have lost doctor. They used to call my husband doctor because he was a veterinary doctor. And I thought, what is he talking about? We have lost him. Now he's, so I didn't really digest what that was because now it's in the night. Then after some time, somehow the Lord just brought me that, let me, what is the doctor saying? He held me and took me to where my husband was. Then I touched his legs. I tried to talk to him. He's, he's not responding and that is the reality hit. And I don't know what happened after that. After some time we went, the doctor took me to his room and I just now somehow came back now to my reality that something has happened. I said, God, how can you take my husband? I have three children. Yeah? They were 11, 10, and 4. What am I going to do without a husband? And then, you know, God is so faithful. From nowhere, as I was asking that question, I said, by the way, which woman would I like the husband to die? You see, God just ministered to me. I said, now actually, it's very sad, my husband. Which woman would I like the husband to die? And then that is how it happened. Very, very tragic. So by that time, the brother had come in because they had been told the husband, the brother is not well. So he was pronounced dead. We went back home. Of course, some close family friends were told by the time we are getting home, it is one. Of course, people kept on coming. In the morning now is the, 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 the worst thing. My daughter, Carl, the firstborn, woke up and came upstairs and found the house is full, yet they had gone when they, they, in fact, they had slept when we, the, when we are not there because we are in the hospital. And she turned back and went upstairs. And then one of my in-laws said, no, we should take these children away. They should go to my home. We should not, they should not know what is happening. And then I said, I felt, if I don't tell my children and they have found all this, who is going to tell them? I said, I, I didn't say anything. I just went upstairs. Went, my son was still sleeping in his bedroom. I woke him up, we went to the girl's bedroom who was staying, and I locked the room. And I prayed. Don't ask me how I prayed, but I prayed and told them what had happened. I can tell you that is the worst thing which has ever happened in my life. My children, of course, cried. We cried. Now people are knocking for us to open. I said something told me not to open. We need to just mourn, grieve together with my children. Of course, the small one was four years. She did not understand. I don't think she really understood what was happening, but she was also crying. And then after, of course, uh, that is what happened. Very, very sad. To the sudden death, I think, I've, there's no death which is good, but I think sudden death is very serious because, you see, these children had been taken to school by their dad, and now they are waking up 
what are you talking about? And my journey started 1997, 2nd of February. Yeah. Mm. Extremely sorry. Like, I don't even know what to say. And um, I think at this moment, I'm just going to rope in first time when two issues that I, I, I can pick from uh, Rahab's narration. Um, sudden death. Okay. How do you deal with that as a person? And then, of course, the second bit is how do you break devastating news to your children? Yeah, before we can move on to the rest of the interview. Um, Rehab, I cannot even begin to imagine how that night, that morning, that season felt like. Uh, but when I look back, listening to your story, of course now we have the benefit of hindsight. I also see wisdom that comes not, I mean, because I'm a believer, I believe that it's divine wisdom that, that comes to guide you during that season. But also, there's also the reality that a mother's natural instinct is to protect the children. And so you see that coming out, even in the moment where your own world mm -hmm. has completely been shattered, mm -hmm. you're still thinking about your children. And that's, that's really amazing. Um, sudden death, all death, all loss has its own complications. And, and, and how we grieve, how we unpack, and how we process loss, how the loss happens has its own complexities. And so sudden death, unpacking that is different from someone who has been sick and you have been watching them deteriorate. You kind of are preparing along the journey. That doesn't mean that even when the person uh, dies after they have been sick for a while, you're ready for them to die. No, we are not ready for them to die. We're taking them to hospital. They're getting treatment because we are, we are creatures of hope. We are hoping that they will get better. Yeah? But when someone dies suddenly, then you're suddenly thrust into everything new. Uh, loss of a husband is one of, and loss of a parent for your children is one of, what, one of those very devastating losses because it's loss of what we call a pillar relationship. A pillar relationship means it's a relationship that affects your identity. You now are no longer Mrs. So-and-so. You are now who? <laughs> You're left there thinking, whose wife am I? Who's, who, 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 who do I belong to? You know, you're no longer your father's daughter and I'm no longer my husband's wife. Who, who do I belong to? You know, and your children, this is their father. Who do we belong to anymore? And, and so pillar relationships impact identity. With loss of a spouse, there's also an income issue. You know, are we then being thrust into becoming destitute? Are we, what, are, are we going to have to change our lifestyle? What's that going to look like? But then there's also loss of, um, when you lose your husband, you lose your present, and you also lose the past that you have with him, and you also lose a future that you had planned for. You had dreamed together, you had a future planned together. And, and the other losses that accompany this, because when you got married, it was partly because I want companionship. You are very clear. I'm not. I don't want to spend life by myself. Uh, you started having a family together, so you also clear that I have someone to parent with. And so the future of parenting with with that with that with with someone is also lost. For your children, losing a father is the future looks bleak. And so all those losses have a bearing on how you grieve and how you how long the journey looks like and how that's going to how you're going to heal. Essentially, uh, Quinta, loss and grief cause distortions. Distortion, distortions are essentially three. One, it distorts your view of yourself. Who do I belong to anymore? Because we belong to ourselves. We never remember that we belong to ourselves. We never remember that we belong to God. But we, we always think that we need to be attached to something to give us identity. So grief causes a distortion of self. Grief causes a distortion of the world around us. How do we view the world? People will be pitying me. What will people will think I'm, I'm a burden, you know? So it, it causes, and, and really, when you're, when you're widowed, people just want to love on you, but you feel like I'm being a burden. But it also causes a distortion of who, your view of God. 
you know, you can be like, where was God when my husband died? I prayed, I fasted. What happened? Why are we being left like this? I serve in church, you know. So when these three get distorted, then everything is shifted. Wow, well, well said, Rab. Uh, Mweni. Rahab, Mweni has pointed out something about when you lose your spouse, you lose your husband. You lose your past, you lose your present, and you lose your future. What are some of those things that you had planned with your husband that really hit hard the moment you learned of his demise? When you think of all that process that you're going to be alone, and then you even talk of they will one day get married. I mean, am I going to be giving away my daughters alone? Or, you know, those small, small things, they, they look nothing, but they really bother you. And you say, God, is it, what, how is it going to be? Because that's the reality. And then you find your life, as my sister has said, it's cut short because your dreams are shattered. <coughs> because as you started your journey, you have your goals, you have your dreams, and all of a sudden, they are actually all shattered. And I can say for me, it's only God who made a difference. Let me be very open. God, thank God I was a born again Christian and I knew God. So just the, knowing that God is with me, that was the greatest encouragement. And say that my church actually coming over to encourage me, my spiritual leaders and the women and all that and hearing and especially the word of God really made me because it's all in the word of God. And especially I like one of our, the, our pastor's wife came and read Romans 8, that 1 to 39, which says, nothing should separate us from the love of God, not even death. You see, I had been reading that, but it didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. What are you talking about? So when she read, I went back after people had left and read, actually it's written in the Bible that nothing should separate us from the love of God, not Family, not, not tribulation, not even death. So I said, even the death of my husband. And that made a turn around. Of course, I started now be, having a different attitude. I said, oh, these things are made, it's there, if it's there in the Bible. So I was, this thing, you know, that, and the, then the word also says, all things work together. What you can ask yourself, what good comes out of the death of yeah? But then the word of God reminds you, yeah, my God was there. He knew my husband, he knew he had children, and this is what has happened. So I can say my relationship with God is the major thing which actually has kept me going even until today. Mm. Otherwise, on your own, I think many people go into depression, go into mental hospitals, and there are people, some people even decide to commit suicide mm. or deny even eating food so that they, can, they give up. So I say my knowledge of my relationship with God made all the difference. To be very honest with you, Quinta, mm -hmm. that made a lot of difference. Mm -hmm. Yes. Did you, after the funeral, or after, how long did it take for you to sort of like find closure, you know, in, in the death of your spouse? Did it get to a moment when you said, you know what, this is the reality, I have to face it, and it's not coming back? I, I wouldn't say but every day becomes new because you face different challenges. You see the children were young. I just left a very good job that I want to do consultancy because my husband was in private victims. And now all of a sudden I'm the breadwinner, not with a steady. So it goes slowly, slowly. I can't really see which one, but with time, especially when the children are, because you have many challenges. You remember now you're a single parent. You have to worry what is being eaten. You have to worry about shelter. Things which had never come with about, you know, like we, we drive, I was driving, but I never knew the cost of a tire until I had an accident and then I was told the car, like, all those small things, the, you know, it is a process. And I think that process of grieving takes time. It, it, took, it, took, it took time. And I think the greatest thing when my children actually, like, when now first one was 18, I felt better because I said there's somebody now who can sign on my behalf. Because that's another thing, the legal implications of death. Because you're on your own, and here you are left, you're used to somebody saying, I'm Mrs. So-and-so, as, as my sister had said. But all of a sudden, we're alone. So I said, at least may God make my children, one of them, reach 18. At least I can ask her to sign on my behalf or something. You know, and I can say with approach, because I had been traveling. I used to work with an organization that would travel. And you know, you see, my question forms, they tell you, status. Believe it or not, all the years I was married, I never noticed there's a status for widows. 
So the first time I, after my husband I died, I went to South Africa. And at the airport, I was given that form, status. Of course, I'm used to marriage, but I am not. And I then I saw this widow. I said, you mean these people know even people are going to be widowed? You cannot believe how I broke down. I cried. And those South African migration thought, what has happened? They tried to console me. Actually, the supervisor was called, put me in. But I know I couldn't tell them. It was shameful to say that I'm just discovered widowhood is a status. OK? That is. So they consoled me and said, what is wrong? And I can tell you I left that airport without saying what it is. I just decided to be quiet because they then would say, what, what does she think? This form has been always there. They are widows. She's not the first one. So those are some of the things. I've done, I say, it takes time. It takes time. It takes time. Say January or February of which year, but with God, all things are possible because not, that's not where I am. Because my children are grown, of course, there are challenges. Especially loneliness is not something you can say you really can cope with. You know, loneliness is a challenge. It's a big challenge. Yeah. Widowhood is indeed a status uh, rehab. In fact, um, in Kenya, there are many widows. I, I decided to dig up some figures. We have about 8 million widows in Kenya. And that is not a small number. They say that's about 15% of the population. Globally, there are probably about 258 widows. Uh, you know, uh, Pastor Mweni, when we are walking down the aisle, the image we envision is that of a happy ever after. We never really envision uh, that uh, bliss being cut short because of the one misfortune or the other, including death. And of course, I appreciate the fact that rehab is, is, is mature enough. Uh, still not to underestimate the pain that she went through after losing her spouse. But then we have this other class of widows. Some of them are in their 20s. Some of them lose their spouses a few days after, you know, tying the knot or a few days before or a few years later. Now, what would you tell that group of, of people? Um, loss is something that happens in life, but loss is not something that happens to life. In other words, there is a possibility of life after loss. It is possible to reimagine life afresh. Now, that doesn't mean that it is always easy for you to do that, but it is necessary. Um, and, and the support now, more than there was in 1997, yeah. we have a lot more resources available to us. Yeah. We have grief therapies, it's, it wasn't quite a thing then. Uh, we have the internet, we, we have, you, you know, the, you can watch a YouTube clip, you can watch uh, a sermon, you can read a book, there are books written about how to navigate it. But then I can imagine at that time when there is not much resources, you're basically just figuring it out. But even today, even with all these resources, we still have to figure it out. Because remember I said that we all have different realities. Your reality as a widow then is different from the reality of the widows that Quinta is talking about. Um, when you're getting married, you want to believe that we will die of old age. Together, together you know, <laughs> and I don't have to live a day longer after my spouse has died. I just want to die immediately with my spouse. And, 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 and yet reality is, it really, it, it's not always a reality for many people. Once one spouse dies and, and the other one has to continue figuring out life on their own. 
and here is what makes me, gives me hope. God has a plan that this spouse who is left has a life to continue on their own. Why? Because if, I mean, and, and this is the same God who says the two become one, but he also allows the, the one to be split. In other words, if God did not have a plan for the one remains, once your husband dies, even you, you'd have to follow. Once your wife dies, even you, you have to follow. But one of the things to recover and help widows to recover is to believe that this is me who's still alive. If they are children, then, then this is my role to, to, to be a mother, to be a father to these children that have been left. But on the other hand, being a mother and being a father is a product of who you are. So if I am broken, then I'm going to pass on my, 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 my heart to the children. So for that reason, you need to get well. You need to get the help that you can get to support you. Now, when a widow, when someone is widowed, there are many, there is the loss. We have what we call actual loss, which is loss of a husband. But then there is what we call symbolic loss. And symbolic loss sometimes is what we trip over more than the actual loss. The actual loss registers in our head. That's my husband, that's where we buried him. I know where he's been laid to rest. But then the symbolic loss is when you wake up and you're thinking, I don't have someone, I don't have a companion. I don't have someone to talk to anymore. I don't have someone to parent with anymore. I don't have someone to even complain about the behavior of the teenager. You know, just the normal everydayness of life. And that's now we must also sit down and begin to see what are the symbolic losses that I have incurred as a result of the loss that I have gone through. And some of the symbolic losses that you incur, you may find other ways to meet that, that need. You know, if, I love, if I've lost someone to help me parent my boy child, who's going to take my son for circumcision? Can I talk to my brother? You know, so you begin to find gap fillers to hold you and carry you through those seasons. But remember that the relationship between a man and a woman is so intimate that there are certain places you cannot find a gap filler. And so you need to be able to find ways to get healthy and get the support you need. Unfortunately, it also means that widows become very vulnerable. Widows become very vulnerable in, 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 in light of loss. And they are vulnerable in many ways, in many dimensions. They are vulnerable financially, they are vulnerable um, emotionally, they are vulnerable uh, spiritually, they're, if they're in a church that does not support them, they are vulnerable um, uh, uh, geographically, sometimes there are places I cannot continue to live here. I cannot continue to navigate this business. There are many ways in which widows become vulnerable, and those vulnerabilities are the challenges of the widows that you're talking about, especially the younger the ones. Younger ones. Yeah. How do we then, uh, Mr. Mwini, how do we then prepare? I know it's very difficult. It's like, I know Kenyans have a very negative attitude towards uh, funeral cover. Mm -hmm. Okay, because we know we know very well that at some point people will die, okay? But we are in denial, you know. <laughs> How do we prepare for loss? In very practical ways, like how, because I know there are people who don't even know where, uh, what, is, what the, what do you call it? The, the, the water bill number, or not the water meter number is, or the electricity, uh, whatever number is. But how then do we, how, how do we prepare practically, you know, without really, thinking about it too much, but just being realistic because these things can happen. The people who don't even have jobs, the people who don't even want to find those jobs, how do we prepare for the unforeseen? Um, you know, now that you say that, it's the very, the, the downside to my job. <laughs> if, if we had a seminar and you're saying, come and teach people how to make wealth, yeah. how to find money, yeah. it will be houseful. Cool. If I call the seminar and say, let's have a seminar on how to lose the money you've made, no one will show up. And yet, people are constantly losing. Yeah. And, and, and so that's a reality of loss. We don't want to think about it. We don't want to prepare for it because we feel like there's, there's a cultural part of us that makes us think, you're jinxing me. Yeah. You know, you're, 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 you're calling it upon yourself. So no, let's not think about it. I will be dead anyway. They'll figure it out. You know, so we all have different, different perspectives about it. But here is an interesting reality, uh, Quinta. 100% of the people who have died were all alive. In other words, 
Anyone is a candidate for death. Yeah? And that means that it can happen to anyone, anytime, anywhere. And so as unromantic as it may sound to a young couple, it may be a conversation to have, what will happen if I die? What would happen if I, I am incapacitated? I may not die, but I may have an accident that declares me, puts me in a vegetative state. What, 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 what am I going, what's going, what, what decisions do we need to make? Will you, will you declare a DNR, do not, uh, do not resuscitate? If I, am, if, I'm, if, I am, if I have cancer and I am, my health is re 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 deteriorating over time, do you declare a DNR? I mean, and so those are, those are very uncomfortable, difficult conversations and yet necessary. So, so even when you talk to lawyers, they say, when you talk to lawyers, things like writing a will. Now, most of us have this attitude that by the time I'm writing a will, I need a piece of land, I need property to be able to write a will. But no, there are things that you can put in your will that are not property. How to dispose of my body when I die? You know, and, 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 and so death is part of life. And it's a part of life that we must begin to acknowledge that it does happen. Hmm. Did you have a conversation with, with yeah. Mr? Did you see it coming? Of course I didn't see it coming. <laughs> but what our pastor has said, for me, I believe the preparation you're talking about, especially for the girl child, is education. It doesn't matter what education, what level, but to be as you get married so that you also need to know you need to be a contributor and I'm talking especially financially, so that you don't get married and think because I'm getting married, I should not do, if I was working, I should resign, or I should not even worry about my career. So for me, education is, is extremely important because if things go wrong, and I can say for me, if I didn't have that education, maybe my children would have been destined, even as much as I believe in God, but I had something to lean on. So I would say the girl child, because I'm, not, I'm talking also about the boy child, because even it, it, either ways, it can happen to either that people have income, and especially because as women in Africa, we are socialized that the man should provide. So you find the big, a lot of ladies see that when you get married, you should take back and go to work about the income. So when death comes and you don't have an income, I can tell you now that is total disaster. At least if you have something to lean on or even a business you can do or you are doing because you're not going to start doing it when the man has died because it will be very difficult. So I say education, anybody who has a girl, child or a boy child, let them have skills. Whatever skill, whether it doesn't have to be, whatever skills which can make them be productive by having an income generating activities because that is key. Yeah, thank you. Well said. Before we, we, we dive into your book, which is about overcoming life's challenges, mm -hmm. and of course, how to get back when death knocks you down, I think you've done a, sp a splendid job mm -hmm. uh, putting your thoughts uh, in this book. Um, Pastor Mweni, I, I know I've asked this question before for those who follow our conversations. What are some of those things that we should not tell people who are grieving? <laughs> I smile because uh, unfortunately many times even I sit down sometimes in funeral services and listen to people speak and think no you shouldn't say that you can't say that but here is the thing to always remember when people are grieving one from the angle of the person who's grieving when people come to see you remember that it's, it's just as awkward for them Remember that, imagine it's a statement of lo they love you, and that's why they've come to be with you. They may say some pretty stupid things. They may say some pretty insensitive things, but they love you. <laughs> and it's important to remember that because sometimes you find that because when you're, when you're grieving, grief is a time of intensity of emotions. So you're very raw. So one person can say a word that will completely... I'm never, I'm never talking to that person for the rest of my life. And so the people who say these things do not have horns and green hair. No, they're just, they, 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 they are, even for them, they are try, they're, trying, they're trying to come to terms with this thing. Um, so some of the things we say, as, especially as Christians, we are guilty of in many ways of saying, ah, it's all for the good. 
how can this be good? Uh, we also say things like, ah, you've lost a baby, don't worry, you'll get another one. I don't want another one. I want this one. Uh, then there are other things that we say that are, are supposed to be a gentle way of saying that thing. But you know, a friend of mine always says, there's no nice way of telling somebody your child has died. Because either way, the reality of your child dying is going to be very intense. But sometimes as, 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 as human beings, as Christians, we also tend to really sugarcoat things. So we tell children that he has gone to be with the Lord. And so a child is left thinking, but we go to church, daddy has been with the Lord on earth. Why do they need to go away to be with the Lord? But then also sometimes they think that he has gone to work and he comes back. So he's gone to the, be with the Lord. He's gone, he'll be back. So sometimes we need to tell it to children as it is, but in age appropriate uh, terms. So some of the things we need to stop telling people is, I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't. Even if I lost my husband and uh, God forbid I lost my husband today and Rehab came to visit with me, it would be very inappropriate for her to tell me I know exactly how you feel. You have no idea because you don't know the relationship I had with my husband and you don't know me and you are not me. So you cannot know exactly how I feel. So, so the, 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 the things that we say to people should should be more of empathy than sympathy. Empathy says, you're in a hole. I will come down into that hole with you and I'll sit with you in that hole and feel the experience of being in the hole. Can I just come and sit with you and not say anything? Yeah, ministry of presence. Just be available, just be present. And sometimes when we will visit you and then there'll be, we'll talk about everything else. We'll talk about the new president. We'll talk about CBC. We'll talk about the Ukraine war. We'll talk about everything else other than we came to visit you because your husband has passed away. So sometimes it's good when you visit someone who's been widowed or someone who's been bereaved to get the cue from the person. Sometimes the person really does want to talk about the person who's died. They want to talk about the, the, the circumstances under which the person died. They want to talk about, they want to relieve because also talking about it for them is therapeutic. But sometimes the person doesn't also want to talk about it, you know? And that's, so that's not the time to ask, eh hey, how did they die? Because it doesn't matter how they died, they died. Whether he died in a car crash, whether he died, whether they, they died by suicide, whichever way they died, that's not important. And so sometimes it feels like they're just being nosy. It's gossip, material, you know. But that's not your puppy. This is not about me. It's about the person that I am visiting. And that's the important thing to always keep in mind. Now, Unfortunately, sometimes as ministers of the gospel, we also have a feeling, we also show up at, with people who are bereaved with an intention to defend God, you know. And so you show up there and you say some not necessary things. Imagine it's also possible for a pastor to come up and say, you know what, even I don't understand this. Because guess what? Grief leaves us very aware of how much control we don't have. And it leaves us all vulnerable. And sometimes the best way to honor your vulnerability is to also show up with my own vulnerability. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask you one final question, but uh, Rehab will speak first. Uh, we have a few, just a few more minutes to go. Think about the secrets that somehow get to the open once we have lost, we have faced some kind of loss. And how do we deal with that? I'm talking about children, I'm talking about wives, I'm talking about wealth, there's so much that goes on, there's so much theatrics that happens behind the, behind the scenes for many people, majority of people, especially public personalities after the loss. So just hold that thought. Let me get to Raha because I want to uh, look at some of the things she writes in her book. Where is it available, Raha? The book is available, actually you can, you can, it's available in the, you can get, you can call a number I'm going to give okay. and then you can pay by till number and it is available you can it can be delivered to you within the city center mm -hmm. and outside the city center you there's a delivery fee mm -hmm. but it's available and also a soft copy is available, available. I'll mm -hmm. give all the details, here. The details yeah yeah now you say something very interesting here that uh, if you look at chapter 7 where you are tackling dealing with rejection and stigma you say some people treat widows like pieces of wood 
and not human being with emotional feelings. Mm. What was going through your mind when you were writing this chapter? I was writing that because of what I had experienced. Because I had some people, even in the, in the church circles, and would make comments, you know, like you keep on repeating your quotes. And I wonder, this person never told me, you know, anything like that. Why are they telling me now how I'm dressed? So it's like, after all now, I can say whatever I want. And people say all sorts of things, actually. And they, oh, you're looking, you are looking, you know, you don't look, you look very, you know, funny comments, you know, something like that. And they feel this person doesn't have feelings. And I, I wrote that because of what I had gone through. And I'm talking of even within the church. That is actually, this person was talking, was sitting next to me, the church is going on, and she says, oh, Rahab, you like repeating your clothes. And I've just been bereaved. Three months, you know, you're you not even thinking about dressing life. It's all darkness. If When I go to the wardrobe, I'm not looking at the, even the colors. In fact, dark colors is what sometimes I somehow not planned, but you feel you just, everything is closed. And somebody makes such a comment and you just wonder, you know. And that is exactly what I was talking, and it is real. And I'm saying it doesn't have to be even outside the church, within the church. And especially even in the families, people make comments, oh, these days you are not, you are looking like this, these days you are looking, you are very negative, you know. And in, somebody will not tell you such a thing when you had your husband. It's like you are covered, and now the umbrella has been, it is raining. The umbrella has been closed. Everybody is free to say whatever they want. And that is the reality. Yeah, so that's a personal when it is true. And as she, she was, our pastor was saying, sometimes it's good just to keep quiet. If you visit somebody's bereaved, if you're not, just keep, just be there. Actually go around, help around, sit next to that person. Because some things people say, especially when somebody's bereaved, it's very bad to start telling person like the widow, and you know the person is already dead. And you're asking that person, what do you expect me to tell you? You know? At that time, in fact, you should not bring the sickness. You should just be there, you know, just to to be um, to be with me, or you just keep quiet. Yeah. Anyway, as you wind up, as you wind up, I can see uh, the clock is ticking. Yeah. Rahab writes in chapter six, uh, putting your house in order. She says, "Widows face many unexpected challenges. Some some stem from the fact that many African men keep secrets from their wives. So when a man dies, the wife may be confronted with shocking revelations." especially concerning finances and property in a minute. How do we manage this scenario? Like I said, um, the awareness that the leading cause of death is life. So have the difficult conversations early enough. Have transparency because you never know what's going to happen. Your spouse could leave home in the morning and not come back home in the evening. What are they, what are they, what, you, in fact, for, because sometimes people tend to think, if I entrust this woman with my money, then she will knock herself out. Don't entrust her with your money, entrust her with your children. So entrust her with the money for your children. But also, here is the thing. This is a person that you have chosen to be with. When you're keeping secrets from them, why did you even choose them to be with them in the, in the first place? We, it, it calls for us to be to live in consciousness, awareness, and intentionality, even in our relationships. With, for all, for whether it's secrets in terms of children, the Unclaimed Assets Authority today is full of assets of, of people that never shared secrets. And now, no one, is, no one is going to benefit from them. Land is getting lost, money is getting lost. I mean, what, what was the, it, 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 it begins to say that your effort to get those things was vanity. How about making sure that those things get to the people that you needed them to get to? Write things down. Write a will. Have conversations with your spouse. Have conversations with your children. Have difficult conversations to even, between you and your husband, to even identify. Should we both die at the same time? Can we go and visit Mr. So-and-so and let them know that this is what we, we will hand over our children to you should anything happen to us. And, and begin to forge relationships with the awareness that anything can happen. Thank you so much, ladies. Time, uh, time is up. Uh, very, very uh, informative conversation about overcoming loss, challenges, trauma. Uh, this specific show, of course, we were, uh, we were hosting Rahab Gatura, who 
is a retired librarian, motivational speaker and author, but of course she also lost her spouse in 1997 and she's managed to live through till now as a widow. Thank you uh, extremely from the bottom of our hearts for sharing your story with us. Thank you, Pastor Mueni. You've been amazing. Um, unfortunately, we have to wind up. Uh, remember, this book is available and uh, the details of where to find it, you can look at the scroll at the bottom. You'll find the phone number, you'll find the PESA details. And in case you need um, a copy, you can just do the needful and get to read about Rahab Gatura's story. Remember, this is her standards. This is the show where we talk about issues objectively. And I want to just thank you, watch, you watching us from home, for keeping it here every Saturday <coughs> for your weekly dose of inspiration. Uh, we are at the James Suits uh, Riverside in Westlands who have graciously hosted us and we also want to send a sincere shout out. Well, till next time, it's bye from us. <laughs>